I'm, I'm delighted to be with you. I do wish it were uh, in person, but uh, I'll take what I can get. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, Hope so for that... next opportunities. Indeed. So are my slides coming up? Yeah, we are seeing them. All right, let me just get it to is present. It, uh, yes? Yeah, everything is good. Okay, great. I should I should let you know that um, I'm using the the web version of Zoom, which means that I don't have the option of seeing my slides and you at the same time, which is annoying. Um, so uh, uh, please make a sound <laughs> if, if you want to interrupt and ask for any reason, because um, otherwise I'll be oblivious. In any event, um, okay, so I, I um, I, I wanted to share with you all some um, some ideas and little bits of work on this topic of of meta learning. Um, I um, I put together a kind of a new slide deck for this talk, uh, which means that I'm not sure of the timing. So for all I know, I'll end up with 40 extra slides that I have to rush through, or we'll be done in a half an hour, and I I really don't know which it's going to be. So so bear with me if the timing is unpolished. Um, but I wanted to um, share with you some stuff that's sort of uh, hot off the presses. So, so, so the background um, for what I want to talk about is um, recent progress in deep reinforcement learning. Um, as cor of course, as, as many of you will know, there has been a real explosion uh, over the past six or seven years um, in techniques for combining deep learning, artificial neural networks, with reinforcement learning, uh, learning from, from reward feedback. Um, maybe um, the first sign of this, uh, um, this surge in progress was this paper from DeepMind um, in 2015, just before, just before I joined the company, um, it, where, where um, a, a rather simple approach was used, uh, combining conv convolutional neural networks with um, something called Q-learning. You know, the basic idea for, for those of you who aren't um, very familiar with, with this realm of um, engineering and research is you just take a multi-layer artificial neural network. Uh, and uh, so in this case, it was getting inputs that were the pixels in the, uh, the screens for Atari games. Um, and you ask the network to tell you what action to take, which in this case was a um, particular joystick action. Um, and instead of using supervised learning where you tell the system exactly what it should have done, instead you give it um, reward feedback. So a positive number um, indicating that something good happened, a negative number indicating something less good happened, um, and a scalar continuum in between. Um, and then the, the mechanism for learning uh, is to maintain a, a set of value estimates, which here are um, indications of the expected cumulative future reward uh, for each of for each, taking each of these actions right now, and then updating that over time with the reward prediction error. So I'll assume that most of the people um, in the present audience are at least broadly familiar with these this, these ideas. Um, of course, that simple approach to Atari games was very quickly elaborated and applied to richer and richer um, task domains, including, for example, uh, StarCraft, um, as reported again from DeepMind a couple years ago. Um, some interesting robotics tasks, for example, this Rubik's Cube application out of OpenAI. Um, coming back to DeepMind work, um, applying deep reinforcement learning to multi-agent problems, in this case, playing capture the flag from um, rich pixel level inputs. Uh, and then perhaps uh, most well known um, are the combinations of deep reinforcement learning as I've described it with um, uh, Monte Carlo tree search, a sort of forward simulation uh, um, uh, procedure, um, which the combination ha has been applied, as many of you will know, to um, to achieve superhuman performance on a variety of board games, including chess and go. So um, that's all the good news. The bad news uh, is that um, deep reinforcement learning has what some people consider to be something like an Achilles heel, which is that it can learn to do amazing things, but it takes huge amounts of data um, to get it to those impressive levels of performance. And th this point was made um, rather trenchantly by Brendan Lake in a paper in 2017, where he looked at learning curves for 
the um, the DQN agent that the one that I talked the Atari agent I talked about um, from the 2015 DeepMind paper, and you can see the learning curve from that agent down here on this uh, particular Atari game, um, Frostbite. And things had already improved in terms of sample efficiency in DeepRL uh, agents by then. And so in all fairness, Brendan included training curves for, um, for more sample efficient algorithms. But then on the same plot, he indicated his own um, performance with that little star indicating that even after two hours uh, clock time of experience with this game, he was already doing really well. Whereas the, the DeepRL agents were still pretty near floor. Um, of course, Things have changed since 2017, but there's still a legitimate argument to be made that um, that these deep RL agents, as amazing as they are, uh, seem to require an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of um, input before they can do anything uh, interesting that you want them to do. Um, and of course, this is in contrast to humans and some other animals. Um, and so we can ask, well, why was Brendan able to play such a mean game of frostbite after such a short time. And at least part of the answer is something that psychologists call learning to learn, and which has also um, since um, gone under the label of meta-learning. Um, the first paper to use this term learning to learn uh, was a, a paper by a psychologist in 1949, a fellow named Harry Harlow. And he introduced a task that will be um, interesting for us as I go along. So he had uh, monkeys in a little cage, and he put in front of them two objects that he presumed the monkey had never seen. And he allowed the monkey to pick up one of the objects, whichever object the monkey preferred. And underneath the objects were little wells. And, the, and so the monkey could see then whether there was a raisin in the well underneath the object or not. Uh, and after the monkey had made that observation, a screen would go down and the same two objects would be placed again in front of the monkey either in the same positions or arbitrarily left, right, left, right reversed. The screen goes up and the monkey gets to choose again. And this repeats for six trials with the same objects. And then crucially, Harlow gave the monkey two completely new objects, which again, he assumed the monkey had never seen. And the procedure started all over again. The monkey chooses, sees whether there's a raisin, et cetera. Um, now, unbeknownst to the monkey, even though new pairs of objects were continually introduced, there was an underlying regularity to the task, an underlying rule, which was that for any pair of objects, one object would be arbitrarily labeled the good object and one would be arbitrarily labeled the bad object. And the good object always had a raisin under it, regardless of its position. And the bad object always had nothing underneath it, regardless of its position. So um, the data was, the data revealed that the monkeys figured out that this rule applied. And so how, how did the data show that? Well, Harlow looked at the percent correct on each of the six trials within every episode with for each uh, uh, object pair, averaging across object pairs. And what he observed early on in the experiment was that uh, as time went by, the monkey would choose the baited object more frequently, but in a very gradual way. But after having dealt with quite a number of pairs in, on the order of hundreds of pairs, the monkey would choose an object arbitrarily when the objects were completely novel. Of course, it couldn't do any better because it had no way of knowing which was the good object. But the interesting thing was on the second trial. So regardless of whether the monkey found a raisin or not on the first trial, on the second trial, it always chose the right object, whether that was the one it chose on the first trial or the other one. So this is a clear indication that the monkey had figured out the underlying abstract rule, which is that one of these things is good, one of these things is bad, and position doesn't matter. So this will be kind of a running example for us of uh, learning to learn in animals. So the idea of getting this sort of learning to learn or meta-learning into artificial agents um, or into machine learning contexts is far from new. Uh, and in fact, there was a whole book on this idea back in the 1990s. Uh, and um, in that book, Thren and Pratt uh, took the first steps toward formalizing um, what this idea of learning to learn actually might mean in a machine learning context. So we'll just read a little bit um, chapter and verse from their book. Um, we will now define what it means for an algorithm to be capable of learning to learn. Given one, a family of tasks, two, training experience for each of these tasks, 
And three, a family of performance measures, one for each task. An algorithm is said to learn to learn if its performance at each task improves with experience and with the number of tasks. But importantly, they go on. To enable a learning algorithm to improve uh, its performance with the number of learning tasks, and let us assume that all target functions, that is tasks, share a common set of properties. So there has to be some shared structure across the tasks that the agent is encountering. Suppose these properties are initially unknown. Instead, the learning algorithm considers a pool of M candidate properties denoted as, as indicated there. The key idea is that by identifying the right properties, the hypothesis space can be diminished, yielding more accurate generalizations from less data. So the TLDR is you have a family of tasks. Those tasks have to have a, a common set of underlying properties, despite their superficial differences. And then by identifying the right properties, the hypothesis space can be diminished. And that's what allows for the sample efficiency. So those of you who are into um, Bayesian formulations already see the prior coming. Um, but this is where machine learning work on, um, on learning to learn got its start. And of course, we can see how the Thrun and Pratt formulation applies to Harlow's monkeys very easily. Um, the properties that underlay all of these tasks, i.e. object pairs, was that rule. And so um, the, the animal was able to narrow its hypothesis space by tuning into that shared structure. Okay, so, so the question um, that we're gonna uh, now dive into is how might that kind of learning to learn uh, um, ability, uh, that kind of narrowing down uh, the hypothesis space, how can that be inserted into deep learning? Um, and ultimately we're gonna address deep reinforcement learning. So the, the approach that I wanna talk about, um, again, is not new, it was, uh, introduced back around 2001, actually concurrently by a number of groups, but um, the, the paper that's best remembered, it was by Hawkrider, Younger, and Conwell. And what they pointed out is that um, you can get this kind of learning to learn uh, almost for free, as long as you um, have a, a learning system that has memory. So uh, in this case, we want uh, a deep learning system that has memory in its connection weights, but also has some other independent kind of memory mechanism. And the memory mechanism that, that they were interested in this paper um, is one that you find in recurrent neural networks. So neural networks that have um, connections among the units that form loops so that activity can be sustained over time. Um, and that endows uh, the network with another form of memory, which is its activity-based memory. Um, for the psychology-oriented people uh, in the audience, you can think of this sort of like uh, a working memory um, mechanism. What Hockrider and colleagues pointed out was that uh, if you take a recurrent neural network and you train it with backpropagation, so the backpropagation algorithm is acting on the connection weights in the network, then the activity dynamics in the network come to, they come to implement their own separate learning algorithm. So you have an, an, uh, an outer loop, which is the back propagation training the weights in the recurrent network. Changing the weights changes the activity dynamics. The activity dynamics are their own memory system. And that memory system learns to keep around information about act, past actions and past outcomes uh, and can be used to support, um, to support adaptive behavior. Um, and so really nothing is added to the setup uh, other than the requirement that the network be recurrent. There's one little cute trick that makes the whole thing go though, which is that if you have a system that you want to map from some input X to some output Y, you input not only the in, that X, but you also, put, you also feed into the, this recurrent network the Y target from the previous time step. So it's not cheating because you want the network to come up with X we well, want it to come up with yj, where j is the time step. But on each time step, you're telling it the answer that it should have given on the previous time step. And this allows it to integrate over time over a whole history of x's and y's, and that's what allows it to then um, uh, adapt um, with better predictions. So you can see this in action in another paper um, using the same technique, where, um, uh, where uh, uh, time, time steps are on the x-axis, 
and error is plotted um, up here where I'm pointing. And these little labels indicate switches between different uh, discrete time dynamical systems that were generating the data. And the, the, the recurrent network was supposed to predict what was going to come out of the dynamic, what, what was the state of the dynamical system on the next time step. But, diff but for different um, uh, time segments, different uh, forms of discrete dynamical system uh, were used. So this is a, a Hainan uh, um, uh, map. And this is a, um, a random, a different kind of random process. This is a logistic map and so forth. And you can see in the error uh, um, time series that when a new dynamical system is introduced, there's a, a, a brief moment where the system makes really bad predictions. But then as the data starts accumulating, the error is minimized. It's, you know, the, 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 the network kind of um, catches on that a change in the in the data has occurred, uh, and it has learned to adapt to these particular dynamical systems um, through a long through long training. Well, all this all this other stuff is just showing you what the internal units in the recurrent network are doing, and you can see that they are moving to a very different part of the um, representational space, a different part of the network's dynamics uh, when the dynamical system changes. So um, so that's that's. Um, that's how to get a recurrent neural network to do learning to learn. Um, uh, hopefully it's intuitive what's going on in that case, but we can, we can be more rigorous, um, in, in, we can put in place a more rigorous understanding of um, why this works. Uh, and, and we can do this by um, uh, using some, uh, uh, an exposition that um, Pedro Ortega and some other colleagues at DeepMind um, laid out in a paper in, in 2019. So, um, uh, so let's imagine a simple prediction task like the one involved in the, the, um, the slide that I just presented. There's some set of observations X, uh, one for every time step T. And um, these are being produced uh, by some generative process. So every X uh, is generated based on the other X's so far in the time series and some parameterization of this generative process. And just like in that um, uh, setup that I described in the last slide, we're gonna imagine that the parameterization can change from time to time. So you draw some uh, set of parameters theta n and you keep them in place for a while and you generate a whole um, uh, history of observations x. Uh, and then intermittently you choose a new, a new parameterization. Um, and the job of the, the system is to predict what x is coming next based on the x's that it's seen. Um, not having direct access to this latent parameterization. So we want to ask, how do we come up with a prediction policy, which we'll label pi, um, which, uh, which can uh, best predict, predict the next observation x based on the history of observations so far, which we'll label tau. And we'll Matt, define, you, sorry. Do you want to have questions as you go or do you want to wait till the end? Um, yeah, clarification question, sure, yeah. So here you say for all t, so as if you actually have a whole sequence for, for an infinite amount of time with one theta. And, you know, it's not that you're changing, it's not a switching process like the one you showed for the full time. That's true, that's true. Yes, that's right. So, so Pedro, um, Pedro's setup was sort of an episodic, um, uh, uh, he made an, kind of an, episo an episode-based assumption. Um, this does generalize uh, to a more open-ended setting where uh, the inference also has to be over whether a change has occurred. Um, but you're right. This is uh, this is this is a somewhat simpler setup. Um, okay, but going with what Pedro laid out here, uh, and it's really the intuition that comes out of it that matters. Um, we'll define a loss, which just says you want this prediction policy, whatever it um, whatever it happens to be, uh, to minimize um, the surprise, the surprise, to minimize the um, uh, to, to max. Another way of putting this is to compress the sequence uh, as best as possible. So Pedro crunches the numbers and it turns out that the optimal prediction policy is simply the posterior predictive distribution, which is to say you select your predictions based on the, the probability of each observation given the previous observations. And if you um, unpack this, then you end up with the expression over here on the right. And you'll notice that um, part of, uh, part of um, this expression is the posterior distribution over the latent parameterization. Um, and if you just, uh, in your mind's eye, picture applying Bayes' law to that, uh, to that term, then you'll see that in order to compute it, you would need access to the prior distribution over parameterizations. 
And that prior is exactly what Thren and Pratt were talking about when they said, you know, you narrow down the hypothesis space. Of course, what's going on in these recurrent networks is what people like to refer to as amortized inference. So it's not necessarily that an explicit model uh, of the generative process uh, is being built, but um, but uh, but as as training goes along and the predictions get better, um, it, the the system must be doing something that's sort of a notational variant on this computation. Um, a couple of sort of footnotes to what I've said so far. So I've concentrated on sort of vanilla recurrent neural networks, things like LSTMs. But it really is true that any system that has um, a trainable memory uh, independent of its connection weights um, will also uh, will also learn to learn in this way. So um, uh, we published a paper back in 2016, uh, which uh, about an agent that contained not only an LSTM, but also a slot based memory, what some people um, kind of uh, um, improperly, I think, referred to as an episodic memory. Um, and uh, the same kind of learning to learn happens in this case, which allowed the, the system to do um, very pretty uh, Gaussian process uh, regression. Um, and some of you will be familiar with recent developments in um, natural language processing in which um, very large neural networks have been used basically for next word prediction um, uh, in a natural language corpora. Uh, using something called a transformer architecture. And it's the same deal here, right? Because the, the transformer architectures have a different kind of memory, which is um, uh, simpler in, in a way because they just kind of keep around uh, um, uh, uh, words that occurred earlier um, uh, and just kind of uh, feed them in in parallel to the, to the predictor. Um, and here again, we see learning to learn emerge in exactly the same way uh, that Conwell uh, described. Um, uh, and in fact, to their credit, the people who kind of uh, um, broke this news uh, with the GPT-3 paper um, concentrate quite heavily on the meta-learning abilities of the system. Um, and one more footnote before I um, get back to the main thread, I just wanna mention that I'm concentrating on this particular kind of meta-learning in, in deep learning systems that kind of happens automatically as long as there's some um, additional memory mechanism, but there are, there are lots of other ways of approaching the meta-learning problem in deep learning that involve doing fancy things with gradients. And I'm, I'm just not getting into them um, in this presentation. Frankly, I find them less interesting, um, but you can also uh, take a, a Bayesian perspective on those. So I'm just putting some, uh, some papers on the screen here. Hopefully I can share these slides with everyone later if you're interested in going down that particular rabbit hole. Okay. Um, so, um, so fine, so we have at least uh, an approach to doing meta-learning in, uh, in deep neural networks, but um, you may have noticed that so far I've focused um, not on reinforcement learning, but instead on supervised learning um, in the sense that uh, during training of these networks, the correct answer, that is to say the identity of the item that should have been predicted in the examples I gave is applied uh, during the back propagation learning procedure. Um, and uh, also remember, we have this lagged input of the quote unquote right answer um, uh, as, as Hochreiter suggested. Um, and, and that's also a form of supervised learning in the sense that the system is getting, at least in this lagged way, explicit information about what the correct, the correct prediction was on each time step. So the question is, can we generalize this, um, this approach to meta-learning, to deep meta-learning, to the reinforcement learning case? Uh, doing so would be kind of cool because, um, of course, one of the most important differences in, uh, between supervised learning and reinforcement learning is that uh, in reinforcement learning, actions, the actions taken by the agent generate the data. So in the prediction contexts that we were just considering, uh, it really doesn't matter what the agent does, the data just keeps flowing in. But in a reinforcement learning setting, uh, the usual setup is that what the agent does affects the next observation that it gets. Um, and so if the task of the agent now is to identify the latent parameterization of the generative process, then essentially what the agent has to do is a bunch of experiments. Right, so this is what a chemist is doing. A chemist is trying to understand the latent parameterization of uh, the generative process in front of him or her, trying to figure out what the causal structure is of these um, chemicals uh, 
Uh, and, and so discovering that latent parameterization, un uncovering that latent structure um, requires active learning. It requires um, the agent to, to do the right experiments. Um, and so meta-learning in the RL context, it, you know, has this interesting additional um, uh, aspect. Um, it, it's, it's really not about ex exploration uh, as we usually use that term in reinforcement learning. It's about exploring in a directed way, a purposeful way um, to efficiently uncover uh, the, you know, what's, go what's going on under the hood in the, in the, in the POMDP that you're currently um, grappling with. Okay, so um, it does turn out that taking the, the approach that Hawkrider introduced and porting it to RL is very straightforward. And um, we pointed this out in a paper in 2016, which was um, pretty much concurrent with a paper that made almost exactly the same point uh, from uh, a group of authors from OpenAI and Berkeley. And, and, and the basic idea is this, hopefully this will sound very familiar given what I've already said. You take, a, you take an, a neural network, you feed in observations and you ask the network to select actions. Um, Remember in Hawkrider's setup, you also provide some information from the previous time step. And here the information that we're gonna feed in is whatever action it was that this agent selected on the last time step. And also critically, the reward that um, was uh, obtained on that last time step. In, in the simulations that I'm gonna present, we're also gonna have the network output um, a value estimate very much in line with the, the um, the temporal difference uh, setup that I um, described at the outset of the talk. And of course, critically, this is gonna be a recurrent neural network. So it's gonna have that activity-based memory um, uh, that allows for it to do this meta-learning thing. And we're gonna train the whole thing, train the weights of the system using uh, a very vanilla um, uh, um, backpropagation-based learning uh, procedure for recurrent neural networks. It's called A2C for the aficionados in the audience. Um, Okay, but then the other thing that we're gonna do uh, um, in line with what uh, Hawkrider did and um, what Thren and Pratt um, uh, described as necessary is we're gonna train this network not on one task, but on a whole family of interrelated tasks. So we'll start with something very simple, which is two arm bandit tasks. So we'll give it a choice between two actions uh, and each action is associated with a Bernoulli um, reward parameter. Uh, and, but after it's had some time playing with that bandit task, we'll give it another bandit task with a, 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 a resampled um, uh, pair of reward probabilities. And then after that, another bandit problem and so on. And then uh, after having trained it um, and set its weights based on this whole series of, of bandit problems, critically now, we're going to freeze the weights. We're, we're gonna turn off the back propagation uh, procedure. We're gonna turn off reinforcement learning, um, at least the reinforcement learning procedure that was used to train the weights. So now we can ask what happens if with these weights frozen, we throw yet another unfamiliar bandit problem at this agent. And what we observe is that the, the, the recurrent neural network happily solves that new bandit problem. So on the left, you're seeing what look like raster plots, but they're actually um, action traces. So in this box is just uh, one episode where the agent chose the left action and saw the outcome, then the right action, then the left action, and then decided uh, based on that experience that right was the, the best answer for this particular bandit problem. Um, this is a bunch of really easy bandit problems. These are harder bandit problems where you can see exploration goes on longer, but in all cases, you see an exploration phase which shades into an exploitation, um, an exploitation phase. And if you quantify the network's performance on these bandit tasks, using the usual measure, which is cumulative regret, like how many bad decisions did this network make um, over trials? Uh, and you compare that with a set of off the shelf, you know, well-regarded um, machine learning algorithms and the, um, the known optimal solution for these uh, bandit problems, which is Gittin's indices. You can see that the network, uh, sorry, I forgot the builds here. The network is doing quite well. Um, in fact, uh, with a few more hyperparameter tweaks, you can match or closely approximate um, Gittin's optimality. Uh, I don't have that figure, but I can um, tell you that that's what we've observed in subsequent work. So how on, the, how on earth is this recurrent network solving these bandit problems with its weights frozen? Well, the answer is the one that um, Hawkrider introduced us to earlier. Uh, and it's that all of the training the network had across bandit problems, um, which adjusted its connection weights, 
led to an activity dynamics that itself implements uh, a, a reinforcement learning algorithm. And so if we look at the, at the internal or hidden units in this recurrent neural network, and we, um, we take that vector of activities across time steps and uh, squeeze it down to two dimensions. Sorry, my phone is ringing awkwardly. Um, then we can see kind of what, what, what the network is thinking. If, if the correct action is left, we can see the activity state of the network sort of trending toward a, 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 an attractor over here to the left of the diagram. If the correct action was right, we see it moving toward a different uh, attractor. If the problem is very hard, then we see it kind of equivocating, but eventually falling into one decision or the other. Uh, so um, in, again, in psychological terms, this is like the, the network using its working memory rather than synaptic change uh, to solve a, a reinforcement learning task. Um, we did some other work to show that this kind of um, uh, learning, which, which I should point out is active learning, right? The network is exploring its options and then making a decision. Um, uh, if you train it in uh, an appropriate context, it actually can uh, tune into causal structure in like uh, uh, Judea Pearl's uh, sense. Um, so if you're interested in seeing um, how we determine that, I would refer you to this paper. Um, but let me make another point uh, moving on, which is that we have one learning algorithm that we built by hand, right? The, 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 the reinforcement learning algorithm that's tuning the weights. And it's giving rise to a sort of, uh, um, uh, to, to a meta-learned uh, learning algorithm. But that second algorithm can be anything it wants, essentially, anything that solves the, the meta-learning task. And importantly, if there's consistent structure in the problems that you're giving um, during training, then it can, cap it can learn to capitalize on that structure. So, um, so in this example, sorry for, the, for jumping back and forth. In this example, we have a series of banded problems where the parameters are tied to one another. So you can see they always add up to one. And if that's, the consistently, um, if that's a consistent regularity, then learning can in principle proceed much more quickly because every action that you choose tells you something also about the action that you didn't choose. But you have to know that that regularity is there, which it wasn't in the first uh, example that I gave, for, you know, uh, for instance. But if you train the network in the setting, then it can learn to capitalize on that regularity. And you can see it from its regret curve that it, it, it tunes into the right answer much more efficiently uh, than it did in the independent parameter case. Okay, so this is just a, a, an illustration of this simple meta-learning mechanism really tuning into domain structure, like really figuring out what those resemblances are, those shared properties are across tasks. Um, so, okay, with that in mind, let's move from simple bandit problems to something at least a little bit more interesting uh, or a little bit richer, um, which is Harlow's task. So um, in, in Harlow's experiments, monkeys dealt with two um, physical objects. We trained a recurrent neural network using the procedure I just described on an analog of the task in which it had to saccade, um, given these visual pixel level inputs, to uh, either of two um, image patches. And just like in Harlow's uh, experiment, we would introduce two new image patches, present them six times, uh, and everything else was the same as in Harlow's task. And what we see after presentation of a whole bunch of uh, image patches is that the network does exactly the same thing that Harlow's monkeys did. On the first trial, it's pretty much uh, at chance. And then on the second trial, it's at ceiling, indicating that, and by the way, this is with the network's weights frozen again. So all of this, learning that, that we see, um, this sort of one-shot learning in this case, is driven by the activity dynamics um, uh, reflecting uh, the kind of meta-learning that we've been talking about all along. So, um, so hopefully that gives you the idea of how we can get meta-learning into deep reinforcement learning systems in order to give them the kind of sample efficiency that Brendan Lake was calling for. Um, I'll come back to um, some observations in a machine learning or AI context, but um, I'm going to um, take a little detour now and tell you about some work that we did examining whether um, uh, the, the setup and the observations that I've just described might be relevant to understanding any aspects of, of brain function. Because of course, uh, we know from Harlow and others, uh, many others by now, that, um, that animals can do uh, this learning to learn. Um, so how, 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 how are their brains accomplishing that? And um, uh, 
perhaps what we're doing in these recurrent neural networks can shed some light on that. So the, the approach here is sort of painfully is, involves a painful oversimplification, but one that as you'll see sort of pays off. Um, and that is to map the parts of this simple recurrent network setup onto um, uh, pieces of um, uh, functional neuroanatomy. Um, first, we'll take the reward prediction error. That's what I'm indicating by the, the little delta here. And we will link that um, thanks to the um, pioneering work uh, that Peter and others have done um, to uh, phasic dopaminergic um, uh, um, uh, release. So that's gonna be our analogy uh, on one side. And then on the other side, we're gonna take the recurrent neural network um, and uh, relying on a large literature pointing out that um, the prefrontal cortex is highly recurrent and also supports working memory functions. And we'll just pretend that this uh, embarrassingly simple recurrent neural network is uh, a model of um, the recurrence uh, and the sustained activity that we see in prefrontal cortex. And we're just gonna run with these analogies and see how far we can get. And it turns out we can get surprisingly far. Um, so the, the Nature Neuroscience paper where we um, uh, present this work describes a whole series of uh, simulations addressing a very diverse set of neuroscientific observations. I'll just give you a little sampling here um, uh, quite rapidly to give you the flavor of how this went. So we started by looking at a bandit task, but a bandit task that had been studied um, in an in, in, in experiment with monkeys. And this is a, from a, 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 a report by Sasui and colleagues. So here um, the monkey was presented with two visual targets and it had the saccade to one or the other. And then it would get a reward uh, depending on which, which item it, it uh, fixated. And the, um, the reward probabilities in this task uh, were changing over time. And they changed according to a schedule that made it, um, made it uh, the smart thing to do to, for the monkey to do something called probability matching. Um, and that's reflected in a performance plot here. I won't go into what this plot is showing, uh, just um, take my word for it. Uh, what, what's reflected in this plot is um, a probability matching pattern, meaning that the monkey was allocating its behavior in some sense proportional to the, the rewards that it was reaping from each option. And again, that's been shown to be uh, the optimal thing to do given the kind of schedule that was used in this experiment. So what happens when you train a, an embarrassingly ordinary recurrent neural network on exactly the same task um, and then freeze, it weight, freeze its weights and see what it does with further presentations of the task with new underlying parameters? Um, and it turns out that the network does pretty much exactly the same thing. It shows a probability matching pattern, um, which is kind of cool because the literature up until we published this paper was suggesting all sorts of special mechanisms to drive uh, probability matching. Uh, and here it just sort of falls out spontaneously um, from a rather generic um, reinforcement learning setup. Um, but the reason that we were interested in the study wasn't just because of the behavior, it's because Susui and colleagues recorded from prefrontal neurons. And um, that gave us the opportunity to take a look at the activity patterns in the units inside our recurrent neural network, which again, we're pretending is a, a, a simple prefrontal cortex and to ask whether the variables that were encoded in those units um, might also be the, the variables that were encoded by the prefrontal neurons that Susui and colleagues um, recorded from. And uh, so what did they see? They saw that um, neurons in dor dorsolateral prefrontal cortex coded for uh, a small set of variables. One was the choice that the animal was about to make. One was the values uh, of the, the, the expected values of the current uh, um, two choices. Um, and also perhaps most interesting, um, other neurons were coding for the recent history of actions or rewards or the conjunction of those two. Uh, and Susui and colleagues uh, created a, um, a plot to show the proportion of prefrontal neurons that were coding for, um, for at least some of these variables. And when we um, analyze the activities of the units in our recurrent neural network in the same way, they showed um, a surprisingly um, similar profile. Um, now, to some extent, this result was guaranteed because uh, our, in order for our network to actually perform the task, it had to be the case that the units in the recurrent network were keeping around information about past rewards uh, and actions. But it's, uh, it's gratifying to see that they do so uh, with a profile that resembles the neural data. Uh, and in, if nothing else, it gives us a way of understanding what the prefrontal cortex neurons might be doing. And beyond that, 
how they develop this ability. Um, the argument goes that it was through reinforcement learning, synaptic, um, uh, synaptic learning. Okay, so um, another, another simulation from the same paper, um, which comes back to this point that I made earlier about how the emergent reinforcement learning algorithm, the one that's encoded in the, or implemented in the recurrent networks activity dynamics, can be arbitrarily different from the reinforcement learning algorithm that was used to, uh, to set the weights in the network, and that it will be adapted to the particular structure of the um, task distribution on which the network was trained. And here, um, we're gonna focus on learning rate. So the backpropagation algorithm that was used to train the network uh, has one learning rate, but I'll show that the emergent learning algorithm can have whatever learning rate it needs to solve the task. And in fact, it can even have a dynamic learning rate. And so to study this question, we went back to a classic study by Tim Behrens and colleagues, where they focused on a bandit task, but a bandit task that had um, reward probabilities that went through phases uh, where they were very stable and unchanging, and then other phases uh, where the reward probabilities were changing more frequently. He referred to these as stable and volatile um, periods of the task. And what he found when, uh, in the behavior of a human subjects performing this task is that during the stable periods, if you looked at their behavior and tried to back out what the learning rate um, uh, should be uh, to guide the changes, the, the adaptations that the humans showed in their behavior, the learning rate, the effective learning rate would go down during the stable periods and then jump up during the volatile periods. And this intuitively is the right thing to do because during the volatile period, you wanna sort of wash out old information to adapt to the new, um, the new parameterization, uh, and the right way to do that is to raise your learning rate. When we train our recurrent neural network on exactly the same um, task paradigm and then interpret its behavior in exactly the same way, we see exactly the same thing. So the recurrent activity, activity dynamics of the network are learning to slow down the learning rate, uh, to reduce the learning rate during the, the stable period and raise it during the, the volatile period. I'm going to skip that um, to get to one last observation from this paper, which is not about um, behavior or prefront the prefrontal part of the network, but instead the reward prediction error signals, which again, we're interpreting as analogous to what's going on, at least in certain parts of the um, mesolimbic dopamine system. So here we simulated a, a study by Bromberg Martin and colleagues. And um, this was a very simple task in which monkeys had to fixate to uh, a target that appeared on the screen. And um, sometimes it was on the left, sometimes it was on the right. And sometimes the left target was rewarded and the right not, and other times it was the reverse. But importantly, the monkey had to figure out which, which of the two was gonna be rewarded just by looking at recent history. So the, these reversals were not signaled in any way other than the reward outcomes themselves. Um, so what Ethan looked at was what was going on in the dopamine system of animals that had been performing this task for quite a while. Uh, and he observed something that he referred to as uh, um, uh, structure sensitive uh, um, uh, reward prediction errors. Um, uh, or, or another label for this is in, inferred value signals. So imagine that uh, the animal's going along and it's been rewarded for um, the, the left, for saccading to the left target. Um, now what happens is a new left target comes on. And of course, the dopamine system is going to get excited because, hey, the left target is the rewarded one. So that's good news. But now let's consider a scenario in which. Uh, to the monkey's surprise, that left target goes unrewarded. And of course, this signals that a reversal has occurred. And now Ethan asks, well, what happens on the very next trial? Well, if the left target occurs again, the animal has just experienced the fact that this, this signal, this cue is now unrewarded. So we might expect the dopamine system to, uh, the, the reaction of the dopamine system to reflect that observation. Uh, and to show a dip instead of a peak. And in fact, that's what you see. But even more interesting is what happens if after the reversal, the other stimulus is presented. So now the right stimulus comes on. The last time the animal uh, encountered the right stimulus, it was of course unrewarded, but the animal knows that a reversal has occurred. So if it understands the overall structure of the task, it should be able to anticipate that the right, the right cue is now gonna yield a reward. So what happens when the right cue comes on? Well, what Ethan observed is that uh, the dopamine system gets excited. It looks like a smaller peak here, but in other data, actually, um, he showed that the peak can be almost as large as, as the one seen for the observed, um, for the uh, previously observed outcome. Um, okay, so what happens when 
uh, we train our little recurrent neural network on exactly the same task, well, we see exactly the same pattern. And that's because the reward prediction errors are based on predictions that are listening to what's going on inside the recurrent neural network. Um, and so they're informed, of course, by a whole history of observations. And um, because the recurrent dynamics of the network can um, shape themselves to the structure of the task, uh, the reward prediction errors themselves become rather smart in this way. Um, so now we can understand how meta-learning can also explain some previously mysterious aspects of dopaminergic function. Okay, so that was a little detour into neuroscience. Um, let's come back for the closing part of my time to um, machine learning and AI. So we've, we've examined how deep reinforcement learning can um, benefit from a kind of learning to learn mechanism. But of course, the tasks we've looked at so far are sort of embarrassingly simple. Um, and so uh, one question is, uh, can we scale this uh, approach up to more interesting tasks, tasks with richer observations and more interesting and complex and hopefully sort of compositional latent structure. Um, so basically we wanna to move towards something like StarCraft, but we wanted to have this kind of changing diagnosable latent parameterization that requires the agent um, to do experiments and try to figure out what's going on um, based on, based on its, past, um, its past learning. And so um, we decided that there really wasn't a good uh, test bed for, the, for, for pushing things in this direction. And so we created one. And that's what I wanna talk to you about with my last um, few minutes. Uh, and this is a, um, a task distribution um, built specifically for studying meta-learning, and we call it alchemy. So it's implemented in, in Unity, and, um, and here's, here's how it goes. You have these objects, which we call stones, and um, the, the agent can pick the stones up, and it can dunk the stones in these things we call potions. And you can see from this video that when you do that, at least sometimes, the potions will change the, the visual appearance of the stone. And um, there are these little markings on the sides of the stones, which indicate how valuable the stones are. The, the brighter these indicators get, the more valuable the stone is. And um, the, in, in the fuller setup of the game, the agent um, faces this table and there are these stones and potions in various colors. And the agent's job is to pick up the stones and transform them into more valuable forms. And, uh, and then it reaps the rewards um, in the form of points when it dunk, when it deposits the stones into this cauldron, um, and and that's that's the whole thing. So um, so what makes this task really interesting, though, is that there's a chemistry that governs how the potions transform the stones, but that chemistry changes across episodes. So um, we have a terminology here which distinguishes between trials and episodes. A trial involves a certain layout of the table and a certain amount of time in order to play with what you're presented with. Um, and, uh, and after each trial is up, the table is reset uh, and the agent plays a series of 10 trials, uh, uh, resampling the, the stones and the potions and so forth uh, uh, with, each, with, each new, with each new trial. But each group of 10 trials forms an episode and between the episodes, critically, the chemistry changes. Um, now, importantly, the chemistry, which governs the way that the potions act on the, the stones changes, but it's also highly structured. Um, so uh, there's a lot to say here, and I'm just gonna give you a flavor of how the chemistry is set up, but the, there's a generative process uh, which is described in gory detail in our paper, but the generative process starts by selecting which stone appearances um, will occur in the current set of trials. And it also determines what the actions of these potions are going to be. Um, and there's, the, there's a kind of grammar that underlies what's possible in, in these chemistries. So um, the grammar says that the transitions will always um, take the form of um, what looks like a cube in the visual feature space. So there are eight kinds of stones in this particular example. And so this red arrow means the red potion will turn this stone into this stone and the green potion will turn this stone into this stone. Um, and the assignments of the potion colors to the different edges 
can change from episode to episode. Um, and certain edges can be removed from this cube, creating bottlenecks and so forth. But it's not the case that everything's possible. And that's the crucial thing. So there are certain regularities. So for example, um, it's always the case that the red potion will do the opposite of the green potion. So no matter what the red potion does, the green potion will always go the opposite direction. Another regularity is that any potion will only ever go one direction in the perceptual space. So you can see all the red arrows are facing in exactly the same direction here. And in any event, there are a whole bunch of other interesting regularities to the chemistry, um, but the regularities uh, don't prevent uh, a great deal of variety across the chemistries. So in fact, there's something on the order of 167,000 possible chemistries. So what the agent has to do is it has to deal with this family of tasks, i.e. different setups with different chemistries, but, and it has to figure out what the common set of properties are, what the generative process is, what the grammar is, and then use that knowledge, which it accumulates across time, in order to do the right kinds of experiments uh, in order to maximize its reward. Um, so you can see an example of, uh, of human play here. We've got things set up so that humans can play this. Um, and so, you know, the player sees what happens with the green potion that made the stone less valuable. So the, the player knows that red always does the opposite. So immediately the player goes to the red potion and reverses what happened. Um, then it try, then the, the player tries the blue potion and it turns out that that yields a very valuable stone. So the, the player deposits that stone in the cauldron and so forth. You get the idea. Okay. so. Um, so I'm about to tell you what agents do on this task before I wrap up. Um, but first, let me tell you about another uh, very nice aspect of this, um, this uh, test bed. Um, and this derives from the fact that we hand created this, hand designed the generative process that underlies the chemistries, which means, as, as Pedro pointed out in this paper, that we can determine the optimal policy. We don't have to, we don't have to, look to our deep RL agents to discover it. We can just build a bot that implements the Bayes optimal um, exploration and exploitation strategy. So we, we built a, a, an ideal observer agent that tells us exactly what the right series of experiments is for any uh, table setting and any chemistry. And so we can use that as a gold standard for looking at how actual deep RL agents are doing on this task. And of course, we're going to use a deep RL agent that has a secondary memory system, which here is a transformer. Um, and we're going to ask how well it does. So we're taking a state-of-the-art deep RL agent that's, that should, in principle, be able to do meta-learning of the kind I've described to you. And we're going to ask, after facing a bunch of chemistries in alchemy, how does it do on a new chemistry? And we're going to compare that to the number of points that this ideal observer gets, which is shown in, with the dotted line here. And the answer is, it does terribly. This deep reinforcement learning agent hardly gets off the ground. And in fact, the number of points that it gets is very close to what's shown in the dotted line down here, which is the performance of a completely random agent. And by random, I mean an agent that just takes stones and dunks them randomly. So um, here you're seeing a top down view of what this agent is doing when you give it only one kind of potion. And you can see it's putting the stone, putting the stone in all sorts of orange potions when it should have figured out a long time ago that the orange potion isn't doing anything and it should just deposit everything that's worth more than zero points into the cauldron. So this potion, this, this, um, this agent is pretty dumb. It's clearly not doing any interesting meta learning. Now you might say, oh, well, but the problem is that the agent is, has to deal with all these very um, complicated visual observations. It's being given pixel level inputs and it just can't, it can't like see through those high dimensional inputs to, to discover the latent structure. So in order to see how important that factor was, we created a second version of alchemy, which doesn't use visual inputs. Instead, it uses a symbolic input, which just says, look, you have five stones and they have these features and you have these potions of this, you know, this many potions of this color and so forth. And the actions are things like pick up this stone and put it in that potion. So also the action, the, the, the action sequencing problem is significantly eased. And what do we see there? Exactly the same thing. Terrible. Um, this supposedly state-of-the-art agent uh, is really at chance in this task. It shows no sign of learning that there is an underlying chemistry that it can exploit, and instead it just sort of randomly dunks stones in potions. Um, 
Maybe then you might say, well, maybe it's the action sequencing problem. Maybe the agent knows what the underlying chemistry is, but it can't kind of come up with the right sequence of actions to exploit that. Um, and we know that's not the case because in fact, if you now cheat, let the agent cheat and you give it an input that tells it explicitly about the current chemistry, like the parameters of the current chemistry, immediately the performance of the agent pops up to very close to the ideal observer. Um, uh, which indicates that if it has this side information, it has no trouble exploiting knowledge about the underlying chemistry. Um, and in fact, if you, so that's giving it uh, like a real leg up because you're telling it something that, that um, means that it doesn't even have to do experiments. We did some other study, some other experiments where we gave the agent not the ground truth chemistry information, but what we call the belief state. So now we're telling it what it should be able to infer about the underlying chemistry, given the actions that it's taken so far. And you can see that that doesn't get it exactly to the ideal observer level, but the agent's doing pretty well. Um, so the setup here allows us to go much further than looking at, um, at points alone. So just to give you a flavor of this, um, and seeing that I'm about to run out of time, I'll go quickly. Um, you can look at, for example, how many potions the agent uses on the first trial. So the dumb agent um, uh, uses lots of potions and it doesn't reduce the number of potions on subsequent trials, so it isn't getting any more efficient. By the end of the, by the end of the episode, its actions have revealed what the underlying chemistry is, but it's not using that information. Whereas the agent that's given the side information about the ground truth chemistry uses uh, um, few, very few um, potions on the first trial because it doesn't have to do any experiments at all. It just knows what the right answers are. Of course, it doesn't reduce its number of potions going forward because it's already very efficient. And in fact, because it doesn't have to do experiments, it doesn't reveal much about the underlying chemistry because of course it already knows what the underlying chemistry is. Um, most interestingly, if you give the agent the belief state, then it uses a lot of potions on the first trial and then it very much reduces the number of potions as it goes along, as it kind of figures out, um, of course, given the side information, what the underlying chemistry is. And by the end of the episode, it's done a good job of revealing what the underlying chemistry is and exploiting that information. Anyway, um, just to wrap up, there's lots more in this paper. Uh, and again, I'll try to share the slides with you for those of you who want this reference, but hopefully you get the idea uh, that deep meta-learning is not scaling very well, uh, at least to this domain. There are hints of how we could get it to do so, for example, by giving the agent auxiliary tasks, um, uh, and that's described in the paper. But I think the honest truth is there's gonna be a long way to go before we can get what looks like a promising approach to meta-learning to scale to like really interestingly structured task domains. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, we started with the question of how we could get better sample efficiency in DeepRL. Uh, and I introduced you to this now pretty old idea of how we can use um, multiple memory systems in order to get there through meta-learning. Um, we've ported this to reinforcement learning and shown how we can end up with agents that do um, interesting directed experiments, at least in small scale um, uh, task domains. Uh, we've tied that at least in an initial uh, hypothetical way to neuroscience. And then uh, full disclosure showed how this approach, at least for now, is not scaling gracefully to, uh, to richer domains, um, so indicating that there's still a lot of work left to do. Uh, and in closing, I just wanna thank the people who worked most uh, closely with me on the work that I've, I've covered, including uh, Jane Wong, Michael King, and Zeb Kurth Nelson. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, fantastic talk. <laughs> Thanks. I'll unshare so I can see people, but we can go back to the slides if needed. So yeah, happy to, happy to, um, to take any questions that people might have. I have a question, if I may. Um, thanks, fantastic talk, really interesting. Um, so a couple of questions about alchemy. So you made some interesting choices there. So it looks like it's deterministic rather than stochastic. And it looks like you're providing um, uh, sort of a local hints as to the gradient, like right? you're making this, this the, the, the colors on this, the stones um, already give you information about what they're worth. So this seems like a huge legs up in, 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 in sort of a toss space. I wondered what the rationale for that was. Yeah, um, well, for almost every design decision, there were lengthy debates. <laughs> and of course, it, it would have been much more fun, especially to have the reward values uh, um, uh, not be so uh, patent. Um, 
And in, in the end, uh, it, the, the camp that wanted to simplify things in that way won out. And, um, and that was sort of lucky in the sense that our main result is a null result, right? So, so agents are doing poorly. Um, so, so the fact that the task is simple in those particular ways actually makes the failure um, more embarrassing. But, but there's really, they're, they're like, you know, there's no, nothing in principle that prevented us from having uh, rewards uh, be, um, be latent or, um, or making the task stochastic, nothing at all. And then the, um, the ground truth agent, how well should it have been able to have done? So you were comparing it to the, to the optimum, so the base opt agent, because course, that's not really quite a fair comparison because it should really do in those straight away what to do. So how much better, how much more juice should there have been? Um, uh, some, but not a heck of a lot. Maybe um, I, I remember it was on the order of like 5% uh, better. Um, so okay. the, the fact that the agent didn't even quite make it to the, um, to the level of the ideal observer is, as you're pointing out, like a, a tiny bit of a failure. It should have been above that. Um, so I think part of the problem is just sort of, uh, you know, accidentally dropping things like um, uh, simple errors that the agents make at the level of the implementation. But, but it is true, there is, a, there is a small delta there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other questions? And uh, Sebastian. So right now it's of course the case that we, we have no deep uh, meta RL agents that learn this task, but ultimately if we can reliably solve this, another, yeah, the, the next interesting thing to do would of course is uh, see how fast the agents can learn this. Is that right? You mean, you mean how much, in essentially how much pre-training they need? Mm -hmm. um, well for, yeah, for sure, right? That, that, would be another, that would be another fascinating th thing to look at. So, I mean, the, the, um, I, didn't, I didn't take the time to go into the, this detail, but the, that little last bit that I showed you where auxiliary tasks really seem to help, at least in the symbolic version, um, uh, the, 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 the auxiliary tasks were, um, uh, essentially counting tasks. So the network was asked to report how many stones of each kind are present on the table mm -hmm. and how many kind, like how many red, how many dishes of red, the red potion are there, which um, presumably encourages the agent to keep around in its internal representations, a sort of a highly discretized or object-based representation. So there, there are a number of things that we could in principle try to, to help the network get there. Um, one might be to do unsupervised segmentation so that it's getting like really good object level representations um, from the get-go, um, or maybe some kind of auto encoding that, uh, that, that encourages it to keep that kind of um, object-based compositional representation around, or to use transformers in a different way that would encourage that kind of compositional processing. So yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, op I'm not pessimistic about the, the, you know, the, the possibilities of getting a, you know, given current technology, giving a deep, getting a deep RL agent to do better, but um, but clearly it's not going to work out of the box. And then once we do get it to work, as you say, the next question is uh, how sample efficient is the pre-training? And there again, it's going to all be about um, inductive biases that yeah. uh, that match the task for sure. Yeah. So I would imagine that the choice of recurrent neural network and training method make a big difference here. So have you tried something like the mu zero approach on alchemy? Um, no, but uh, we've been able to share around uh, alchemy within DeepMind, and so now the, you know people who are uh, you know who who are spending their whole day kind of um, doing head-to-head -head, uh, comparisons between the latest and greatest um, uh, uh, RL algorithms and architectures uh, are are working on that. So we'll we'll know soon whether whether Mu Zero does better. Um, so far, I will tell you uh, that Mu Zero in particular is doing terribly. Um, <laughs> so so I, can, I can share that with you, but that doesn't mean that the next uh, hyperparameter suite won't, won't, uh, won't break through. It, that we're getting the same results, it, it just is at chance. I will, I will give it one, one bit of credit though, which is one thing that I didn't say um, and probably should have, is that in order to get our VMPO agent, the agent I talked about, in order to get it to do anything, uh, we had to use kickstarting um, from an agent that had been given shaping rewards just to pick up the stones. So even to get it to that like random dunking policy, we had to give it a little help. And mu zero gets to that level on its own, but it still doesn't figure out the latent structure at all. And so, so there's still more work to do. Thank you. Sure, Robin. 
Uh, did you want to ask? Uh, if there is still time, because it's uh, not a sure, question. Uh, one more question. Is yeah. it possible? So I was curious uh, regarding the pre-training. When you talk about pre-training, uh, the, tra the kind of training the human subject get, like from the child, I mean, from death till the, I mean, adulthood during the uh, development, and also the innate brain also doesn't yeah. have a random wiring. It has some structure because of genetics. Do you think these yeah. two components is also important for getting to the human level? performance also well i mean the biological case for sure i mean you know uh part of the meta learning process is evolutionary learning i mean that's just that's just got to be the case right um and i don't know what the task distribution is <laughs> but but it's it's pretty interesting no matter what it is um and so you know we don't really at least in the approaches we're taking so far um with artificial agents we're not making that division unless maybe you think of the, the initial architectural choices as uh, coming out of some kind of evolutionary learning process uh, operating at the level of the researchers. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, there, clearly there's, clearly there's, there's more to the story than just the, the, you know, focusing on the training of those recurrent um, dynamics. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, uh, I, I, if I understand correctly, what meta learning does is basically uh, a search in the algorithmic space. So it looks looks for an efficient algorithm, and uh, uh, and then uh, the R squared and the uh, original paper does this in a basically uh, molar free way. So mm -hmm. it, like the uh, the external reinforcement learning algorithm is molar free. So I yeah. was wondering if uh, if if you think it would be beneficial to think about this problem in a model based way, in the sense that like uh, like, like um, uh, the agent would have an explicit representation of the algorithmic components and how they could, could be composed and how, how this search in this space would evolve over time and like maybe even plan in this space. Um, that's a fascinating possibility. Um, one thing that I skipped over is uh, some work showing that like the, the opposite can occur in the sense that even if you train on the outer loop with a model free algorithm, the learned algorithm can show properties that make it look um, model-based. Um, uh, but of course, that's not what you asked. Um, I guess the challenge there would be to define uh, what the, essentially what the action space is, right? In other words, what is it that you're searching? Um, and, and that seems like a pretty hard blank to fill in. Um, you know, one can imagine I guess one can imagine a sort of bootstrapping procedure where you start with a model free, uh, like you start with a model free training algorithm, uh, be, which is, you know, could be model based, but it just doesn't know what trees to search, right? Um, and then it starts coming up with solutions on the inner loop. Uh, and then something like maybe um, symbolic regression is used to back out uh, a kind of um, discrete representation of what was discovered at the inner loop. And then you use that to feed. I mean, I, there are all sorts of interesting possibilities. Um, I, I personally am not aware of anybody taking that approach. Um, although in this day and age, it, almost anything you can think of, there's got to be a paper somewhere. So like, I can't guarantee people aren't working on that. But it is. I agree. It's an. It's a fascinating possibility. Um, thanks for raising it. Thank you. I'm sorry. Any other question? Okay, so looking forward for one to one meeting on Thursday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. That was fun. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time.